You're in, Ed. <laughs> We're in the control centre. We're about to go down to one of the one of the caverns. So this side uh, over here are the, is the particulars of the different aspects of the detectors. There are about four detectors make up the whole detector. Each one has got different parts. And uh, on this side is the main control room where they look after the safety of the detector and the running of it. So this is a great idea. These are the people that work on CMS and there's uh, portraits of them all. And then if you stand back, you can see it's in black and white and the, the white bit make out the words CMS, the letters CMS, and they're all the women. Can you push in a little bit further? Yeah. Would be better. Do you have? Do you have? I can do How often do you see that? <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting to get access into the into the cavern where the detector is, and just behind this wall here, and apparently you just go a, a little Warren's nest, but you, is the LHC itself, the, the the actual ring where the particles come round and then come into the detector. But uh, it looks like uh, there's, we haven't got access yet. We're in. <laughs> Cavern. <laughs> so be careful of the step. <gasps> wow! <laughs> That's hey. what <laughs> <laughs> This is it, it's the detector. We're here. And you've got the beam comes in and it goes into this monster. It's noisy. It's it's like if you've been on a, a on a ship on um you know across across the English Channel or something and you're you're on you're on the the hum of the engines constantly. That's what you can hear and you and you can just see people, I mean you just get an idea of the size of it. There are two people here. And they, I don't know. This it's uh, about, 20, about 15 metres tall and 15 metres across and it's something like 26 metres long. It's huge! Well, I've calmed down a bit now, Brady, and I think I can begin to talk about it. Um, Let's perhaps begin uh, with, the, with the pipe because it's, it's amazing. There are these two people that we can just see across here and they're doing some work on the detector. Uh, but if you look by the head of one of them, you can see what looks like a goldish pipe. Look how small it is. That's the LHC pipe. That's where the protons are coming in. At the, about just within three meters per second of the speed of light, they're coming in. They're coming into the detector here and in the centre of this detector, which is about 21 metres long, so about 10 metres in here, they're colliding with another beam of particles which have been coming the other way. Or well, one thing that I was just been told about the beam, which I hadn't thought about at all, was the beam in the centre is made of a different material. The, the pipe is made of beryllium. And you sh it's in order to make sure that uh, when the particles that are created from the collision of the protons come out, they don't just hit a big steel beam, pipe and just bounce off in all directions, they can get out. And so they've had to, it's the most sensitive part in many ways, is the central beam pipe of the LHC, which is in the, in the center of the, of the detector here. When they collide, it's really important that they remain within the sealed pipe, that they're in a vacuum, which is 10 times better than the uh, vacuum in the, in, on the moon. I mean, the atmosphere is so, so small, there's so few particles in the pipe that anything that's created doesn't interact with anything else, it can, it can move out. So you've got this central bit of the detector, which is the smallest bit, but is in, in fact the most sensitive, because there they've got, they've got pixels, lots of little pixels, something like 80 million per square meter, 80 million per square meter. They have to be able to monitor the, the direction and the momentum of the particles that are coming out, so that they can work out where exactly the collision took place. And so they've got this very sensitive stuff made of semiconductors, silicon, so that any particles that comes out barely affects it. It, it. You get currents flowing through the silicon and that allows you then to read off 
where the particles have come from, the particles aren't affected. They then move out to a second set of detectors called uh, the calorimeters. And the calorimeters actually stop the particles, nearly all of them. They absorb the energy of the particles. You've got the electromagnetic calorimeters, which will stop the, the charged particles like, like um, uh, uh, photons that are produced. Well, they're not charged, but they'll be stopped by the uh, electromagnetic calorimeter. Anything that inv interacts electromagnetically will be stopped by those. If you go further out, you have the hadronic uh, calorimeters, and they stop things that are neutral and, and, and undergo the strong interaction, like the, like the neutrons. Any neutrons that are produced get stopped by them. And then on the outside, the bulk of the detector here is actually for stopping the muons. These elementary particles, which are uh, like electrons, but 200 times heavier, and they're so important because if you find a muon, it tells you that something really high energy has happened. They're very difficult to create. And so you, if, if, a, if a muon's detected, and, and they're very difficult to detect, they just shoot through all the other things we've been describing. If you get the muon out in these outer uh, rings, and in fact, the, there's a set of muon detectors, these silvery looking uh, detectors here uh, on the end cap, and they're surrounding the whole, the whole detector. They're there to absorb the muons that come through. And then inside all of this are some huge magnet, magnets, solenoid magnets, which produce magnetic fields of around four tesla. And that's the way you detect things like charged particles. One of the ways that you know from school, a charged particle going through a magnetic field will get bent by the magnetic field. And because this is so compact, so dense, they're able to do it so that the muons will, as they come, th they're, they're created in the center of the detector. As they come out, they'll get bent in one direction. They'll then leave the solenoid. And because they're leaving the solenoid, the direction of the magnetic field changes. So they're bent, say, this way, and then it, they get bent that way. So there's a unique signature of a muon, like a wave, getting bent one way, then the other. And by detecting them, that's the first, ex first piece of evidence that they have that there's some high energy physics going on, some new physics. And they use that to actually determine which events they're going to keep. There is something like 800 million collisions a second going on in there. So they can't keep all the data from 800 million collisions. So what they do, they have to have a trigger system, a way in which they can say, well, out of those 800 million, how many do we, are we interested in? And one of the first, the level one trigger is to look for the muons being detected. Within microseconds, they track back to the center of the detector and look for what else has been present there. And they make a decision based on that on whether to keep the event or let it go. And they go down from 600 million a second they actually store between 100 and 200 events a second so that they can analyze them later on. I think in the course of a year, if they stored every event, the CDs would, take, would go to the moon and back twice. That would be the, the amount of data they could store, and they can't. So you need this big detector, basically, even though you're dealing with such small particles, they're moving with so high velocities and their moment is so great that you need a, as big a region as you can to in, increase the chances of, of finding them. But not only finding them, determining precisely where they've come from in order to work out exactly what the collision was like. But I just want to show one thing, Brady, before we uh, go. And if we just look here, I didn't know about this. If we look over here, we see this big thing that weighs something like 100 tons. It's a door. And that door closes where those men are it, to seal in the uh, beam. And it's there to protect the beam. It protects it from the radiation and particles that are coming shooting out of the detector so as they don't then go and destroy the beam. That red thing up there is a the fire extinguisher. There's a group of them all along. The, the fire extinguishers, once they're on, they take seven minutes to fill this whole cavern with foam so as to protect it. Safety is the most important thing for the people here. I couldn't envisage it being as big and, and yet as compact. You, I, I really feel what they mean by compact. It's great. What do you mean? You just feel the density. That's steel. That's solid steel all the way through there, these caps. There's three layers in there of these, of these steel caps. 
we've got to go. There's a crew from Russia here now. It's, it's amazing. There's non-stop. <laughs> We're in the, uh, sort of the heart of the computing side of it and the, um, where the data first comes in and where you have to begin to make decisions on what you're going to keep and what you're not going to keep. And uh, these are control systems. So if, if we just come down here, for example, these are the control systems that are monitoring how the tracker is going, the inner tracker is going. And then you've got, we talked about the triggering and how you make a decision. If we just go walk a bit back up here slightly, you come to the global trigger. And the global trigger is, a, is, a, is the method that, is, that decides, starts deciding whether or not to keep an event and to, because there's something like 800 million going on a second, they can't keep it all. And so they, they make these decisions on this level one trigger. And when they've decided from the level one trigger they're going to keep something, they, they put it all together. Uh, and these are the cables in which all, it all comes through. And you can see where it's got the ECAL and the HCAL and the tracking detectors. And they bring up that one event all together and then they send it off to decide what to do with it. It's ridiculous because th this is just one little part of the whole complex. It's, I can't get my head around this, it's so, so big. This is just crazy. So we've got here the, just a set of the cables. There's a whole nother lot over, over the other side of this room which are taking both the power down to the detectors to, to run them. And then they've got, the, I think it's these white cables are the optical fibers where they actually transmit a lot of the data itself. So they've got a mixture here of the red and blue, which are the power cables, and then the white, which are the optical fibers. And just miles upon miles of them.